delighted to um, introduce our first student modeler um, talk for today. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about like um, um, Cyprien and Basilie's work um, at the awards tonight too. So, so I'll um, leave some of what I'm going to say to them. Um, but a big applause is warranted to like Cyprien Basilie, who is the um, student modeler award um, and competed in this um, annual uh, event that CSDMS puts up um, for graduate students to submit their best modeling work. And so we're going to see today about um, simulating mangrove mudflat dynamics with a hybrid eco, hydro and morphodynamic model. And this is work that's been done at uh, IHE in uh, UNESCO IHE in Delft University, or IHE in Delft, I should say. Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'm uh, very honored to be here. So uh, thank you very much for the selection committee for uh, choosing me uh, to receive this annual award as a student modeler award. So uh, yeah, uh, my name is Evrian Veseli. I am uh, from IG Delft, the Netherlands, but originally from Indonesia. So like a uh, blue, like uh, not 24 hours, but actually just eight hours from, from Amsterdam to here. Uh, but first of all, this for I'm uh, sharing my, my research that I would like to convey my greatest appreciation to my uh, supervisory team member. So the first is uh, my co-promoter, Mick van der Wegen from IG Delft and Uwe Gruters from uh, Gießen University in Germany, Johan Reins uh, from IG Delft, my promoter, Professor Dan Rolfing, and Jesper Dijkstra from Delta Res. Well, uh, basically, uh, what I would like to share uh, this morning is part of my PhD research, where the objective of my PhD is to develop uh, a modeling tools that enables us to quantify the performance of the mangrove on the variations of physical and environmental forcing. So let's think about what will happen with mangrove that if you are, let's say, having a, an extreme sea level and what happens if you have like a uh, high, high storm surges and waves, and if you want to apply this, uh, maybe if you, want, if you want to connect it with our first keynote about the nature-based solutions, so then how can we quantify the, the, the mangrove ecosystem restorations with the another, like the four things. And then uh, when we are thinking about the mangrove, it is not static, it is dynamic. So basically it is changing over time, over time and over scales. So. Before we start, so maybe you should ask why, why should I or we need to do this kind of modeling exercise? Well, uh, mangrove probably within this decade is, has been recognized as one of the high priorities for, for example, like sustainable uh, climate solutions. Why? Uh, because this mangrove forest is like uh, having this some so-called uh, multiple ecosystem services. Well, probably coming from uh, coastal protections as a carbon sequestration function, to let's say social cultural function as well. And then uh, when we are looking at that particular parts, uh, when we are facing with this climate change, there is some kind of global push on how can we dealing with this climate change mitigation adaptations and natural based solutions in particular mangrove is one of the solutions on it. And when we look at this global, global uh, let's say uh, movement, there is a global push in promoting so-called green belt policies. When we are looking at this UN declaration on ecosystem restorations, that they are aiming this ambitious goal that by 2030 that we want to increase uh, the mangrove extent up to 20%. When we are now in 2024, just halfway to 2020, uh, 2030, and well, we are still having a lot of work to do. So in that sense, what will be the role of modelers like us? So I think as a modelers that we need to contributes on how can we help them to achieve these goals because it is really ambitious goals. Because in the fields, there is a fact that 
in the last maybe decades that 80 to 90 percent of restorations have failed. So when you are looking at the records, when you are planting or restore 10, then maybe one just survive. It's very bad. Why? Because if you look at the reports and the data that uh, most of the ecosystem uh, mangrove restorations, they are dying or the seedlings just really stunted, is small. Why it can be happen? First, because the mismatch of mangrove species. Just think about if you want to plant a mangrove species A, but instead of planting A, you plant B. So this is not correct. Or if you have the same species like species A, but you take this species, you took this, this, uh, the seedlings from another location and you plant it to another to, to, to your side. So it's, it doesn't match. Or you ignore this sometimes so, uh, the so-called uh, hydromorphological and ecological, ecological systems. Well, it is understandable because it is quite a complicated processes, which I can show you next. So, if you are looking at the dynamic of the mangroves, there are somewhat a coupling of the biology or abiotic and abiotic system. When in the abiotic system, you see that there's the four things from the physical, which is we can call as wave, current, and discharge variations, and also the environment uh, four things, such as for example here nutrients. And not only that, we see that mangrove is also complex. So I took one an example like a, from my case study in Indonesia, like this Avicennia species that with pencil roots, Rhizophora with street roots, Bruguera with knee roots, and Candela candle in plant roots. So in the perspective of, uh, of uh, hydraulic engineering and hydrodynamic, it's very interesting because they have different root structures, meaning that we need to find a way how to parameterize that. And if it is coupled with physical and environmental forcings, it either can be positive, meaning that uh, we have this lateral expansion of the mangroves following with the increasing level of the, of the bed level, or it can be negative, such as we have like a, uh, let's say, erosions on the bed level, and in effect, we have the degradation of the mangrove extents. So we need to find a way on how can we, let's say, model that in, in our uh, exercise. So uh, from what I found in the literature, there is some different time scales and also different scales of the, of the space as well. So when we look at the local scale, that the mangrove is heavily influenced by first, the hydroperiods, meaning that it controls the expansion of the mangroves. So the more you're inundated, the more like a higher chance you will not be able to survive because it's just inundated. And then the other one is the function and the salinity and also the nutrient that controls the vertical growth of the mangrove. So when you couple these two functions, then you, you know you have this zonation of the mangroves. So there is one species that, so-called the pioneering species, that is able to survive in high saline and highly inundated uh, conditions, but the others are not. So then we have these variations of the species along the gradient of the bed level. And if you think to couple that with another forcing such as waves, and also like uh, another processes such as in groundwater and river discharge, then you have really complex interactions that you need to solve it in a smart way. So that's why uh, in my research, I uh, propose on to do somewhat so-called a hybrid modeling, meaning that I couple the individual base model of mangrove and, las and landscape based uh, model for hydromorphological machine. So then if you look at these vertical layers of the, of the let's say, mangrove system, so we have this, these two more important layers, for instance, like uh, the subsurface processes, the subsurface processes and the and the seawater on top of it. So in subsurface processes, this processes is basically affected by the rooting, uh, let's say, uh, process or uh, rooting mechanism. So then the root system can grow, so it expands and increase the level of these layers. And then the surface processes that is affected by the hydrodynamic condition on top of it. So the scale is really different. If you look at subsurface processes, it can be maybe annual to decades to maybe hundreds of years, centuries. When we look at the surface processes, it can be in the scale of waves, meaning seconds, or in the scale of tides, weeks. So this update is really, really, uh, really different in, in, in time scales. And when we look at the vegetation itself, the mangrove, they also have their own time scale. They have, the, they have their, their life cycles from adult trees, when the adult trees start producing the, the propagules, the propagules is following the, the waters, and when the water is getting low, then it can be stranded. And the, if the condition is just right, I mean, it's always dry that it can be 
grow into seedlings and if the wave is okay there is no toppling no no erosion no no, no uh, like a burial then it can survive into saplings and so on and so on so then we need to find a way on how to couple it because we want to have this mangrove plant and soil feedbacks so therefore uh, in our model that we try to follow the trajectories of mangroves from seedlings to propagals uh, to see uh, to, to saplings into adult trees and to see the interactions of each conditions with the different forcings of the physical and environmental so thinking like a, if you are like a human being so you have this, the the life stages from the baby to like uh, to toddlers to kids to adults and then you have different results even though in similar environment so let's say if you're a baby but if you are both with really high temperature then it's really danger for you but if you're an adult with the same temperature you will be fine it's also the same thing with, with mangroves so how do we approach this? So this is really a simplified scheme, schematic for a conceptual diagram of my uh, model. So we divide two forcings, the physical forcings and the environmental forcing. So for the first version of a model, we assume that the environmental drivers will be always optimum, in optimal condition, it's always be good. But then we play with the physical drivers. And then these drivers will be forced into our uh, initial mangrove compositions. And these mangrove compositions and also their structures will give an effect. So the response will be the change in wave attenuation, the change in flow alteration, and the changes in, in soil surface. And the changes in the physical or hydromorphological condition will, will give a response, will give a feedback to the, to the mangrove in terms of these three to three competitions. Well, when the competition is too high, so we expect the mortality. But so does with the seedling. So then, once the, the mangroves start to produce the, uh, the propagals, then we see how the, let's say, the physical forcing will give an effect to the seedlings, either whether, whether they can survive or not. So then, by the end of the, uh, the loop, we see, and we evaluate whether these propagals can survive, so we see this some of the pioneer establishment and the mangrove recovery. So then the loop will start. To look at more details, so this is how we do it. So basically, we utilize the CSDMS BMI that is embedded in the 3 d flexible mesh. And we use this as a wrapper to communicate between, between each other. So it communicates with mesophone. So we have these two loops, the outer loops and the inner loops, with, in which they have different uh, time steps and time scales. So basically, we couple the vegetation for every three months. So every three months, we, we pause, and then we rerun the, the, the simulation based on the, uh, let's say, aggregated conditions in the inner loop, and we run it. So that is the reason why we choose three months. Uh, that I will show you later on, that, that we try to capture the seasonal variations of the forcings. So let's start. Uh, since we have this initial uh, position of the mangrove, such as the position and the biophysical properties, we transform this into the bulk drug coefficients, in which this coefficient will give an effect of the hydromorphodynamics, such as the water level salinity and the morphological change. And this water level variations, we calculate this as the window of opportunity, which gives us some probability of the probable establishment from zero to one. So is one is always be able to establish. And then the salinity will be given effect of a salinity field. So then this salinity value will give an effect on the optimum growth of the mangroves. And then we also take the information from the tight residual current to know how far the propagule will be dispersed. So let's say if you have one of the mangrove and it drops the propagule just within their canopy, and then we add this information from the residual current to, to know how far the propagule will be, will be uh, distributed from the, from the parental trees. So then we uh, translate this information as reduction factor and the factor of ceiling establishment, and we feed it back to the mangrove dynamic model so then it can rerun again and then it will start the, the loop. So, uh, okay, now we have this theory and we have built the model, so how can we, we test it? So, uh, we test this model in, in, another, in my study location is in Indonesia, in, in Porong Delta. So maybe if you know or you don't know about this, that, uh, back in 2006, there was a volcanic mud eruption in the hinterlands. And then, uh, well, I don't want to discuss about the, the the causes, the cause of these volcanic mud eruptions. But since that eruption, that they have to contain the muds, and then they, in the big reservoir, and by uh, the wet season, they pump the mud into the river. So then it's such as like a giving them like a 
to refer something like a, like a, like a mud channel. So then we see this uh, huge propagation, uh, progression of the delta and so as the, the mangrove. So I think it's a good exercise for us to start with. And then we have like a quite a lot of uh, information on the mangrove species on the particular locations. So then uh, to support this information then, but the problem is we need to know the mangrove biophysical characteristics and the variation over time. So we uh, coupled, so we apply this, uh, let's say UAV based SM, SM, uh, SFM photogrammetry to get this digital elevation model of the mangrove, but cannot be height model. And if we uh, can smartly couple it with the mangrove extent detections from the satellite imagery, we can get this edge and height relationships that we can see uh, the development of the mangrove over time. And what is surprising me that the mangrove extent is not linear, but they are seasonal. So there is a peak and down of, of the mangrove. So if you see in the middle panel that they are not just linearly growing, but they have this peak and, and low. So then we want to know, we want to, uh, let's say, mimic that uh, processes in our model. So we just choose really simplified model, a funnel shape uh, delta where we have this one delta loop in the middle, and we run it for 60 years. And we play with this uh, variation of discharge and concentration. Well, because luckily, uh, this poron delta is somewhat like a like big controlled uh, channel that they have the slice gate in the, in the upstream. So they control the, the, the discharge of the river. So we somehow can, let's say, know the, the variation of, of, the, of the morphological development in that particular uh, location. And in Indonesia, we have two seasons, wet season and dry season. And we try to, to, let's say, to model it in our model. So this is the results of this, uh, I call it SDFM phone. So the flexible mass, left to the flexible mass coupled with mesophone. So what you see here that uh, in the middle, I plant the, the trees, just like uh, following the delta loop. And over the years, it starts to grow. When, when, it's, uh, reaches, it, when it reaches the adult age, then it starts to produce the propagules. And when the propagule drops, it follows the trajectory of the tidal current. And when it is low, if, if the water low, then it starts to stagnate and grow. And we see it over them. And then the presence of the mangrove is also affecting the development of the morphology. So when you have the mangrove, you have the bed level increase. But once the mangrove already occupied the space, the bed level almost remains the same because they are somewhat like stabilizing the space. And the nice thing of this model, because it is following the individual trajectory of the mangroves, you can also see when the mangrove starts to occupy or colonize the northern and the southern channel. And that explains the variations of the peak and low on the seasonal horizon in our observation. And in the panel, at the, at the bottom panel, uh, I compare it with the observation. Well, for the vertical, for the, for the tree height is okay. It's, it looks nice, like uh, with one meter error difference. But for the expansion rate, is um, not that good because we see that it's really uh, different within the observation and the model. But it is explainable because in our model, the source of the propagule is just only from the local mangrove, just inside the, the delta loops. But in reality, the source of propagule is just coming from the another mangrove forest as well. So you, as you see from this uh, left bottom panel that you have mangrove forest at the northern part of delta and also from the southern. So then during the, uh, the wet season, there's also another propagules coming from different forests. And then, since we can follow this trajectory, we can also see the, uh, the seasonal mangrove canopy area developments. When we look at the seasonal signal, and then we see that there are uh, two, uh, let's say, flex points. The first one is the, the starting point that is start to deflect, maybe in the, the first five years. And then another part when it is already in around 25 years. So what is causing this? Eventually, we, the, the causes of this is because the different scenarios when we apply the sediment supply from the, the upstream. So what we see here, like uh, when we give the, 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 the delta with a lot of sediment, we see the, 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 good, the, the largest expansion of the mangrove. But if we are limiting the, the, the source of the so then it also has the smallest mangrove area. So it seems that mangrove is heavily dependent on the allowable area for the mud flats. And then when we uh, isolate the seasonal variation of it by using loose model, we see this like peaks. So it is true that in, during the wet seasons, 
it shows the, the beginning of the mangrove production or mangrove development. So because it is more fresh and saline, and then they start to produce the propagules, we see it starts to peak, it starts to, to going up, to growing. But then the September is the peak of the productions because they start to grow after forming as the propagules and start to produce as a, as a seedling, oh, sorry, as a, as a saplings. But then since September is like at the middle of dry season, they start to have the competitions. So we see the dieback of the mangrove. So we see the decrease of the, of the mangrove. So we see that uh, this model can somewhat mimic the, the real observation that we have in Porong Delta. And when we look at this error, like uh, in the left, in the, in, the, in the last bottom of the, of the panel, that it shows the, the breakout of the session. So we see this difference that the first uh, error is showing the initial population that has mattered. And then when it is the probable, I mean, when the mangrove start to colonize the northern and, and southern channel. And then, yeah, and we see that this is also happening in all of the places. And when we try to, to compare this uh, with another scenarios that we see that uh, different forcings lead to the different, di different dynamics that it seems that the salinity in our model is not as the main limiting factors, but the sediment supply is one that is having the, high, the, the, the major factor that when we give them more sediment, then we see that uh, the mangrove is, is growing faster. And we're also interested to see, to compare uh, with and without mangrove and the effect to morphology. Well, the model is uh, missing the wave factor because the model uh, uh, in Porong Delta, they are tight dominated. So then we turn off this, uh, the wave module. But we, see, we still see that the effect of the mangrove to the delta development. Then once we have mangrove, we see the bed level increase at the downstream part. So basically, that mangrove is slowing down the current. And once it's reaching the end of the, of the trees, uh, sorry, the mangrove forest, it starts to uh, have the, the settling of the sediment. And we see the, the build up of the mangrove. And uh, okay, be just a short uh, remark. Well, uh, what happened if we want to, to let's say, utilize this model more further? Then, uh, what if we want to use this model to optimize the mangrove restoration strategies? So the motivation is about carbon. So basically, mangrove can act as a carbon sink if it is healthy by means of the above ground biomass, so it captures by this body, by this leaf, and also by, by this uh, function of the roots. So it traps the sediment, and because of this water lock condition, then we can capture the, the, the carbon. But what if it is slow? So when there is no mangrove, so basically it becomes carbon source. So uh, we are playing around with this uh, scenario, so then we just, again, schematize the model. So we just choose, let's say we have this open coast settings, and then we couple flow and wave, uh, and then uh, we place the, the mangrove base on the tidal elevation datum, so then we place above the mean sea level, let's say above the high water spring, and also the, about the high water nip, and what will happen? So when we run it for about 20 years, it, there is the reason why 20 years, because uh, we want to mimic it as, a, let's say, what if we compare it with the engineering time scale? So what happens if you want to compare nature-based solutions and non-nature-based solutions? And surprisingly, uh, the mangrove planting that is planted really close to mean sea level, it has this counterproductive effect that it has this huge erosion near to the fring. But if you plant it more higher in the platform, they, are, they tend to capture more sediments and it uh, even grow further. So then it has like uh, the largest uh, extent than the one is close to the mean sea level. When we look at this, uh, let's say, average annual erosion and sedimentation rates, that it is true that this mangrove helps to trap the sediments in the forest interior with the maximum build up is just close to the fring, and then they tend to, let's say, stabilize the, the bed level in the interior. And when we look at the, the mangrove population, and we also see that there is an effect of uh, let's say we call it the, the, the pressure gradient. So when you see here is this quite different, uh, the mangrove population that is close to the mean sea level and the one that is higher above in the platform, that once you have the mangrove is really close to the mean sea level, meaning they are, uh, let's say, being uh, close to the higher competition due to the higher inundation and higher wave exposures. So then you see that a lot of mangrove diebacks at a particular part. But if you're planting it higher in the platform, there is a higher chance for them to survive. 
Well, uh, the end of the, uh, the slides, uh, the future directions of the, the research. Well, because I'm a coastal engineer by training, so of course I'm more interested on how can we, let's say, utilize the mangrove forest as coastal protections. So, in the model, then uh, right now we are just assuming that everything is going well. So, uh, the, the mortality is only governed by the uh, competitions of the adulteries and also the, the, the barbago establishments. But next, we need to find out how can we quantify uh, the functional capacity of the mangroves by looking at uh, how the storm will, uh, let's say, uprooting the mangrove trees, what will be the effect of storm to the, to the let's say, uh, branch or stem breakage, and then what will be the recovery rates on that particular part. So we also be able to, let's say, uh, estimate the persistence, so how long this mangrove forest will recover after such extreme events. So, uh, that's all, so thank you very much. Hello, I'm Viboy from Augustana College. It's great that you have some representation of Southeast Asia region in the model. Um, have you tried um, to model mangrove regions, especially when the buildup of delta is decreasing and the sea level is rising? How would that also affect? And did you start out the mangrove animations or simulation as a singular tree, or is like a group of a certain number or discrete number of mangrove to make it sustainable? So, uh, well, that is still uh, the work in progress, so I have the master student that's helping me to run the simulations on the sea level rise conditions. Well, uh, right now in our model, you just assume that this mangrove is uh, only have one species with uh, dominant, uh, uh, dominant species is in Avicennia. Uh, but in our work in progress right now, that we are also including different species. And then what will happen with the different sea level rise condition and wave and the effect to the zonations of the mangrove and uh, to what extent it will give us some kind of a protection capacity for coastal protection.